everyone. Welcome back to The Human Perspective. It's my privilege today uh, to have as our guest, Gabe Kassarath. Gabe's pronouns are he and him. Uh, we've invited him to be on the program uh, today for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is this is all LGBTQ Pride Month. And Gabe um, is a gay man, and we can get very briefly into talking about um, his partner. But most importantly, um, I had the privilege of getting to meet Gabe a number of years ago when he was working at the National Federation of the Blind. And I think his story is great. And you'll see that, like everyone, he has very many interesting strands of his life, which I will attempt today to braid loosely um, because of the amount of time that we have. So welcome to the program, Gabe. Thank you, Judy. I'm so excited to, to be able to chat with you. So in the discussions that we were having before we started taping, um, we were talking about your family. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you're blind, and you were blind from birth. Yes. And uh, you had numbers of jobs. And the last job that you um, had before coming to Houston, you worked at the National Federation of the Blind. Mm -hmm. And um, could you uh, share a little bit of information about your blindness and its uh, connection to your family? Sure. Uh, so I was born with hereditary glaucoma. It runs on uh, my dad's side of the family. My grandfather was blind. My dad's blind. One of my aunts is blind on my dad's side. Uh, one of my older brothers is blind. So am I. Um, so it, it, I, uh, the first interaction I had with blind people was when I was born. Um, and one of the reasons, like I was telling you earlier, that I really was drawn to NFB was because I met a bunch of blind people that I wasn't related to. I think it's a very, made me smile. Um, so when you think about yourself and other blind people that you know who are blind from birth or early on, um, what do you see as some of the advantages of having grown up in a family where Blindness was not atypical, but quite typical. So one of the things, and I don't know, Judy, if this is because we were blind or because we were a poor Im immigrant family, um, but I wasn't treated any differently than anyone else. Um, in your family? In, our, in my family. We were expected to uh, play with the other kids, to play with our extended family, you know, and, and most Latino com communities and most immigrant communities. Uh, your extended family and your cousins are your friends. Um, and we were expected to do all the normal chores. And I think that really set, at least for me personally, a healthy expectation of how I should value myself. And my mom always told me that people were going to look down upon me because of my blindness. It, it was interesting that it was never because I was a Latino, but because I was blind. And, and that I had to work twice as hard to prove myself. And we were talking briefly about your experiences in school. So you went to elementary school in a regular school and because you had some vision, um, they didn't want to teach you Braille. What did your mom no. do? And so my, my very fiery mama um, had very impassioned IEP meetings with, with the people. And I, I think it's important to keep the, the timeline in mind. This is, early to mid 90s. Uh, this is a Latina who has has been in the United States maybe three or four years and is fighting really hard to get their kids education and to get them their appropriate education. Uh, but she got her point across. Um, in the fourth grade, I started getting uh, Braille instruction full time and, and I'm a proficient Braille reader because of that. And I'm so grateful for that sacrifice that my mom made. And you said in the beginning, your parents were undocumented. Yes. Can you speak a little bit about that? So I am what um, folks love to consider the, the dreaded anchor baby. I have the privilege of uh, petitioning for adjustment of my parents' uh, immigration status when I turned 21. But they lived in this country and paid taxes for 23 years uh, before I was able to do that. And you were successful. I was. 
I'm sure they're quite grateful for you. And um, you also, we were talking about the dreamers and you've also been involved with the dreamers. And I wonder if you could, you know, briefly explain to me what some of your concerns are regarding the dreamers in the US and some of the actions that you think our audience can be involved with in helping to uh, bring forth the problem that dreamers are not being made legal. So one of the things that I learned very early on in, in racial justice work and, and particularly immigration work is that those of us who have status have privilege and we have a certain degree of protection that our brothers and sisters who are undocumented and who very often are putting their bodies and safeties on the line uh, don't. And so when we have the opportunity to petition our government, when we have the opportunity to participate in protests without the, the fear that an arrest might lead to a deportation um, and that our dollars also have power. Um, doing the work to raise funds to assist mutual aid organizations, to assist organizations that are providing direct services to immigrant communities that are trusted by the communities, I think those are some concrete actions folks can take. We were talking earlier about the racism that exists in this country, and you now are the director of the mayor's office on disability in Houston, and the remains of George Foley are going to be coming back to Houston. And I'm wondering if you could share with us a little bit of your feelings about what has been going on uh, more prominently over the last week and a half. So I've been hurting. I've been hurting as a person of color. I've been hurting as a member of the LGBT community. I've been hurting as someone who till this day has undocumented family members. Uh, one of the things that one of my good friends, uh, disability rights activist in her own right, Conchita Hernandez taught me a long time ago was that our, our liberation is intertwined racial justice, is criminal justice, is disability rights justice, is LGBTQ justice. So, so I've been hurting and mourning with my black brothers and sisters um, because this is senseless and horrible and, and such a, a disregard for human life. Um, what are some of the messages that you give family and friends as we're all going through this difficult time? as far as actions that you believe people should be taking? So specifically to the Latino community, I saw something on Facebook the other day that really spoke to me. There's a lot of anti-blackness that we learn in our own community. And, and it comes from our abuelitas and tias and parents and people that we love. So we have a responsibility to talk to our parents, to talk to our aunts, to talk to our grandma and grandpa when they make that joke, when they make that remark, when they try to explain why, they, why it is that they don't like uh, black people, we have to step up and, and help to bridge that gap. And when you've been involved in those discussions, um, how has that, what are some of the results that have happened? Those are hard conversations. Um, those are very hard conversations. They're not always pretty. Um, but I, I don't think that we should let up, we should ever let up because when we do, we'll just accept the status quo. So the message here is have difficult discussions. Absolutely. Do you have other family members who support you with these difficult discussions? Yes, um, I, I'm very fortunate in that um, my family is very diverse, so we, <laughs> We have everybody uh, under the sun and and there are folks that in their own immediate families are also having these discussions and and coming to these very important realizations now you um you majored in political science and i'm wondering why you chose that as a field so watching president obama uh run uh in 2007 2008 uh, was a big uh, draw point for me. I was very interested, I became aware of how government impacts our daily lives. Um, and especially 
uh, towards the latter end of President Bush's administration, there was a lot of discussion around immigration and immigration reform. And I was a freshman in high school and I, I started becoming keenly aware that my citizenship status was a point of privilege uh, because a lot of my family members and my close friends in high school uh, were and are people who are undocumented. And I wanted to do something to make the community around me better. So I decided to major in political science. And you feel that's the right field? Absolutely. You glad you majored in it? Absolutely. Now you work at the National Federation of the Blind, uh, which is also a member of the World Blind Union. And uh, there's a treaty that the United States has joined on called the Marrakesh, it's the Marrakesh Treaty. Yes. Maybe you could really briefly explain what it is. And also the, the United States has ratified, which is amazing because we still have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But in addition to giving us a little bit of information about what it is, could you also, um, as a person who went to school in the United States, could you talk how talk about how this has impacted you personally? Sure. So the Marrakesh Treaty allows member countries of the treaty to exchange accessible formats among each other. Um, they allow the cross-border exchange of books in accessible formats. Uh, so for me, in addition to being a political science major, I was a Spanish major. And when we started getting into the advanced literature classes, uh, and you had uh, Pablo Neruda and some of the other great, uh, G Gabriel Garcia Marquez and some of the other great uh, Spanish writers, almost every single one of the texts that were assigned, I had to convert to accessible screen reader format myself uh, because they were not available anywhere through the normal channels that we would use to, to find that information. So when I heard that the Marrakesh Treaty would allow this, this accessible exchange of information, uh, I was immediately hooked because I thought about people who are in that same situation or people who may not even be in school, but who are living here in the United States and who are a person with a print disability for whom English is not their first language. And, and opening those doors to literacy uh, spoke very personally to me. So people who are interested in being able to read Spanish materials if they're blind, where should they be going to get this information? Bookshare is doing a lot of great work now that the Marrakesh Treaty has been implemented. That's the, that's the resource I use very often um, to find these materials. And how do they, is it bookshare.com? Bookshare.org. Sorry, bookshare.org. I encourage people to do that. It'll give you information. If you're blind or low vision, or if you have a physical disability like I do, where you have difficulty using your hands and your arms for books, or you have a learning disability, uh, Bookshare is a great place to try to get materials. So you have to be registered as having a disability. So if you go to that website, it'll explain everything that you need to do. Thank you very much for that. Um, Gabe, you were at the National Federation of the Blind from 2015 to 2019. You're originally from Houston, Texas, and now you're back at home. Um, now you're the director of the mayor's office on disability, and I'm wondering if you could um, uh, tell us why you were intrigued by applying for this job. So this job marries some of the things that I'm really passionate about. Uh, it, it marries civic engagement, uh, at disability advocacy, and policy work. Uh, and I, I really loved my stint at the Federation as, as a staff member. I loved digging deep into policy, uh, but I, I am also very much enjoying developing programs and strengthening programs that, that uh, are front-facing, that are community-facing, um, to, direct to directly engage local people with disabilities. Um, and, what drives a lot of my work uh, is, is intersectionality, is because of my lived experiences. Everything that we do here in the office, I'm always thinking about making sure that it's cross-disability, intersectional, and representative 
of the community here in the city of Houston. So when you were 16 years old, what would you have liked to hear from someone like yourself? You're gonna make it. Um, you are probably not yet comfortable in who you are, uh, but you know who you are and, and you know what you want. Um, and there is so much value in finding and developing those mentor relationships um, that can show you uh, and get, pro provide you guidance and advice. Um, I would have loved to have a, a disabled queer person of color um, as a mentor when I was 16. Thank you so much, Gabe. It's really been a wonderful opportunity to learn more about you. And obviously we will stay in touch and we'll share information about the mayor's office so that others can look at work that Gabe and his staff are doing. Thank you very much and please keep strong and safe and we look forward to more of your leadership. Thank you, Judy.